Good to see everybody here tonight. Glad that the weather's shaping up like it's supposed to, and I think everybody else is too. Um, if you missed the memo today, one of the things we mentioned this morning is that I learned how to tie my own tie. So if you weren't here, um, I don't have to ask my dad anymore. Hopefully I can keep it up. But it's good to see everybody here tonight. I like those songs that Wayne were was singing about heaven, and I think we're all going to get there. I think we're all going to help each other, and uh, you know, let's let's just keep keep coming here, keep worshiping, keep teaching, and let let it, let everything grow and prosper you know, the way it's supposed to. So um, tonight's lesson, I, I was listening to a sermon on online from Stephen Rogers. A uh, man we all, a lot of us know, he preaches down in Evansville, and uh, he preached a sermon on uh, this one of these Old Testament stories that we're going to talk about tonight. He drew out some of these points, and I was like, hey, that's really good. And so I, I took a lot of the outline from his sermon, and I'm going to present it tonight, some of these Old Testament thoughts, and we can apply them today, and they're very, very good thoughts. So the title of our lesson is, When God's Law is Forgotten. When's God, when God's law is forgotten. You know, we live in a world today, in this society, where attention to God's law and His ways, is, it's decreasing more and more as the days progress, isn't it? God's ways are untaught in homes across America. Children don't grow up going to Sunday school the way they once did, and it doesn't happen anymore. Even denominational churches, they, I mean, they, they don't... They're, People are unchurched nowadays. Kids don't grow up that way. Children don't see their daddies sitting down to read the, the Bible or their mommies studying the Word of God at the kitchen table and they're not living it. God's laws aren't practiced in this country so many times. And by so many, God's laws are not respected. So many have forgotten the God of heaven and are allowing this culture, this changing culture, to influence their moral values and the, what we see as right and what we see as wrong. Because of the changing culture, it's getting a little hazy for us. We can't really tell what's right and wrong in this culture. And I'd like to emphasize tonight in this lesson just how rapidly wickedness can take over a nation. And if you want to go here, how quickly wickedness can take over a congregation. There's a lot of lessons for, for us nationally, personally, congregationally that we can get uh, from this lesson tonight when God's law is forgotten. And so I'd, I'd like to start by reminding us of a statement made by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 10, 23. And he says, Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. So we need to understand, you know, that, that's kind of why I put this picture. We need to understand that we are the creation. And He is the Creator, right? He designed us. He designed each and every one of you. He knows how we work. He knows the way we think. And God knows you better than you know yourself. Why? Because He's the Creator. He knows how we work. He knows your brain better than you know yourself. And mankind simply is not capable of leading himself through this life successfully. God knows the best way to live this life because he designed us. He know, and, and he knows what way is best. I'd also like to start by reminding us of what Proverbs chapter 14 says in verse 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You know, we in America, we... Americans take pride in our military, maybe our economy, and things like that. But this is our focus here. Is this is what really is going to help, would help this country is if a nation could turn back to God. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight. So tonight I want to talk about an Old Testament story. Maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't. And I want to focus on a very good Old Testament Bible character that kind of might fly under the radar. And, uh, I, I want to take us back to a time period in Israel's history where God's laws were completely forgotten among the Jewish people of the time. And then I want to show you what happened when a young king came along who decided in his heart that I want to serve the God of heaven. I want to pursue God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. 
And I want to show you the impact that this young king had on such a wicked nation. And it's a pretty incredible story. When I mention the name to you, King Josiah, does that ring a bell to anybody? You know, if you study the Old Testament, you probably get all of the names of the kings mixed up like I do, and which one was from Israel, which one was from Judah, there's so many of them, which one was good, which were bad. Hopefully by the end of this lesson, you'll know a little bit more about this man, is that he was one of the great, great kings over the land of Judah. And you're going to remember the faith that he had in the God of heaven. In spite of all the cultural things that were happening around him, he put his faith in the law of God. And you'll remember his great decisions that he uh, made to help turn this nation back to God for a time. And the people were faithful to God after Josiah was, was in the reign. As long as he was in reign, the people were faithful to God. And so you can read about this man, Josiah, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23. Also a parallel account is in 2 Chronicles 34 and 35. So if you're writing notes, take that down. I'll start by uh, giving a few facts about Josiah. He was the 16th king of Judah. Uh, 16 of 20. You know, when, when Judah first began, you know, originally you had the United Kingdom. You had those first three kings, Saul, David, and then Solomon, who each of them reigned 40 years apiece. And then the nation broke apart right, when it got to Jeroboam, Rehoboam. And Israel was the ten northern tribes, and the two southern tribes, well, that was the nation of Judah. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, was the first king over those southern two tribes in that land of Judah. So he was the first king. Now Josiah is the 16th king in that list of kings. So that puts it into perspective of where we're at. Josiah was a very young king. And I, you know, there's a lot of good lessons for young people in this, in this sermon tonight and in examining the life of Josiah. That even though he was young, he was a great servant in the eyes of God. And you know, really sometimes I think we make age excuses and a lot of times it's I'm too young maybe sometimes it's I'm too old but uh, we're going to see by the tenacity of this young man that it, it doesn't matter if you have God on your side it doesn't matter what age you are if you can make faithful decisions and stand up and do what God wants you to do it doesn't matter what age you are as long as you're standing where God wants you to stand and so it, it, the Bible tells us he was very young Second Kings 22 and verse 1 tells us Josiah became king over Judah when he was eight years old. That's pretty young. Um, you know, I don't really get that and why they used to do that, but it was just that, you know, the next king in line, stick him in there. <laughs> um, and so obviously he had some advisors that were helping him uh, when he was, first started out. And it, so he's a young king. And he reigned, the Bible says, 31 years in Jerusalem over the nation of Judah which would make him 39 years old at the time of his death. So he lived and died a very young man. He didn't live to be very old. The Bible also says that he began to seek the Lord when he was 16 years old. All right, so here's a young man who stands up and says, I'm, gonna, I'm going to serve the God of heaven. And we're, you're going to see a lot of idolatry that, that he's having to deal with. That, that's what the people were doing. 2 Chronicles 34 and verse 3 says, For in the eighth year of his reign, he would have been 16, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. 2 Kings 22, this passage says about him in verse 2, it says, And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Right? He walked after God's ways. He didn't turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Josiah was a man who, as, as king over the land of Judah, agonized in his heart over the terrible sin that was taking place in this nation. And, and when we see his response to all of this sin and how he dealt with it as king, it really reminds me a lot about what the Bible says about Lot from the book of Genesis, living in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. Second Peter talks about Lot. And in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 2, it says, talks about righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day 
by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. And so in Josiah's story, we can, we, we can see that same concept. Is that a, a man who was seeking after the Lord. He, he observed all of the wicked things that are happening around him. And it brought him to despair. Seeing their lawless deeds and their disobedience to the God of heaven. And in this lesson for us today, I mean, if, if we want to apply this for us today, is that if you are in love with God and His ways, then the conduct of the wicked and the way that they act should utterly disgust you as a child of God. And we should feel like this, tormented in our soul, when we see the things of this land and the unrighteousness that is being practiced and promoted out there today. You know, even the thought, now, these evil acts should make Christians uh, grieved in their hearts when they see it. In Psalm uh, chapter 119, and verses 1, 104 and 105, says, Through your precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. And this is the attitude that King Josiah had. And so when he comes to the throne, first off, I want us to understand who was king before him. His father... Manasseh. Manasseh was a wicked, wicked king who reigned before him. And he reigned as king for over 50 years, and this man was a big promoter of idolatry and so many other wicked deeds. Throughout his reign, he allowed so many wicked things to rule his nation. He did not seek after the God of heaven, not at all. He didn't even attempt. He even, as the Bible says, sacrificed one of his own children to an idol with fire. That's how bad this nation has gotten. In 2 Kings 21 and verse 6, talking about Manasseh and how bad this king was, says also he made his son pass through the fire. And that, that's a phrase for what they were, were doing in the idolatrous days as they would offer up their children and, and different things. So he did that and it says he practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So that's who his father was. But then we see Josiah come to the throne. And the Bible tells us that he destroyed the idols that his father had brought up and that had been reigning in the land. And he, the idolatrous priests he got rid of throughout all the land of Judah. Second Chronicles chapter 34 and verse 3 says, In the twelfth year of his reign, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of idolatry. And he was going to get rid of it, right? And I want you to get this. The 12th year of his reign. He's 20 years old now. 20 years old. And he begins purging the land of this sin. He said, I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to get rid of these things. This is contrary to God's ways. We don't want to practice these things. And they say young people can't make good decisions. They say that, we're not, that the young aren't capable of making good decisions. Well, that, that's not right. Sometimes young Christians, I think, get the idea in their head, oh, you know, I'm not old enough. Maybe when I'm older, I'll start seeking God and I can, I can do it then. Like I said, sometimes the older Christians are like, well, I'm too old. Well, what is the right age to serve God? Well, who's going to do it if, if, if you don't? Josiah was 20 years old. We need to listen to that. Is that that's young even in my eyes. <laughs> Is that, you know, so he's been seeking God for four years since the Bible says he was 16 and here's a man who stands up and says, you know what? I will clean idolatry out of this land. And he stood up for God and, and, and God's righteousness and got rid of these things when he came into power. Now, I want to give you a, a quick list of some of the things that Josiah did in cleaning out the land of Judah of all of this sin. There's, there's many things and I didn't put all of them on here. He commanded, first of all, that the articles used to worship Baal and Asherah to be removed. And get this, from the temple. These false gods, Baal and Asherah, that they had brought them into the temple that was supposed to be used to serve God. Second Chronicles 34, verse 4, says, And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest, the priest of the second order, and the doorkeepers, to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. 
So you see what was going on here in this nation? The temple. The kings before him had brought in idols of false gods and had placed them in the temple where the God of heaven was supposed to be worshipped. He also removed all of the idolatrous priests that the kings of Judah had ordained to lead worship to Baal. And he burned their bones on the altar, 2 Kings 23 and verse 5. He removed a wooden image of Asherah, burned it in the Kidron Valley, ground it to ashes, and then threw them on the graves of all the people, 23 and verse 6. He tore down the houses, get this one, he tore down the houses of homosexual prostitutes in the temple where Asherah was being worshipped, chapter 23 and verse 7. Are you getting this? Is, can you imagine this occurring in the temple? They're, they're doing idolatry in the temple that was built by Solomon for God. And there are homosexual prostitutes living and, and, and doing these things in the temple. And worshiping idols. So he's getting rid of it. He says, I'm going to get, get rid of all this stuff. And so number five, he destroyed altars that Ahaz and Manasseh had built, 23 and verse 12. He destroyed the altars that Jeroboam had built at Bethel, chapter 23 and verse 16. You remember when Jeroboam had, you know, where, where were they supposed to go to worship? They were supposed to worship in Jerusalem. But when, when this split happened, Jeroboam didn't want them going back to Rehoboam's city. And so he, he designated a few different spots that they could go to worship. That wasn't according to God's law. And now King Josiah stands up and says, it's done. We're going to go back to God's way. We're going to go back to, to all of this. So are you hearing some of the things that this man did? He removed all the shrines of the high places in the cities of Samaria. And he's getting rid of all of this sin. And so the nation of Judah, I want you to get just this picture. Before this man came to power, he became, I mean, the, the, the city or the, the nation itself was as corrupt as it could possibly get. I want you to see, you know, they didn't seek God. They pursued false God. And they were practicing sexual immorality and unfaithfulness in the very temple where God's worship was to be practiced. So you can see the sort of things that can happen to a nation when, God, when God's law is forgotten. When you throw God's law out the window, this is the kind of stuff you see happen. And Josiah the king agonizes in his heart when he sees these things. Another thing that this man did. He not only cleaned out the temple, but he also said that the temple needs to be restored back to its original state and refurbished. In 2 Kings chapter 22, verses 3-7, through 7, the Bible talks about in the 18th year of King Josiah's reign, he was 26. Josiah began uh, to set commands in place to repair God's temple that had so, for so long been neglected. We're going to fix it up. We're going to get it back to its rightful state to glorify God. And it's the next part of this story that I want to really focus on in this lesson and, and draw this out. There was an incredibly awesome find that they came across in the temple. As, as they had been cleaning out these articles of Baal and all this idolatry, getting that out of the temple, and they're, they're seeking to restore the temple back to what it was. In 2 Kings chapter 22, and verses 8 and following through the rest of that chapter, it talks about what they found in the temple of God. As they're cleaning, Hilkiah the high priest finds the book of the law in the temple. The book of the law. It had gone unnoticed. God's law was lost for years and years, and it was in the temple. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 8, it says, Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Now I, just, I want you to just stop and let that sink in. They didn't even know where the book of the law was. And you know, to our understanding, that's Genesis through Deuteronomy. Right, the, the, everything written by Moses, and they, they didn't even know where it was. Now I was kind of wondering, how was he seeking after God? Was there, there might have been a, the, the writings of the prophets of the Psalms, but here, here the, is the law of God that has all of the feast days that they're to, to 
to do and all of the, the laws for them that they are supposed to follow. And they didn't even know where it was. It was lost in the temple. Imagine that, being in the temple. And so it was a scroll containing the law of God. They didn't even know where it was. So certainly the prophet Hosea's statement uh, could definitely apply to this generation that we're reading about. Hosea 6.4 My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, God says, I also will reject you from being priest for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. And so my warning always for us is, may this never be said about us at the Davidson congregation. Is that we're not going to forget God's laws. We're not going to let it be hidden in our lives. So what happens next in this story? I want to continue with it. So the book of the law is found. Uh, Hilkiah, the high priest, then gives the book to Shaphan, uh, the scribe, to read it. And then Shaphan reports back to the king, Josiah. And then he reads it in the hearing of Josiah. He reads it to him. And Josiah, when he heard the law of God, when he heard the things that were written, and what God's will was for the people, what they had been doing that was so corrupt, and he heard the words of God, all the commands that they had been neglecting for years and years, the Bible says that Josiah literally tore his garments in despair when he heard the word of God. Second Kings 22 and verse 11 says, Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. And it, it just it ate him up inside so much to hear. And that's the convicting power of the Word of God. You hear what was required of you and what sin is, and you learn what was required, and we're not doing it. We're not doing what's written in the book of the law and the the covenant that God made with our people, Josiah said. Now, really, that's the attitude that we all should have when we realize our sins before our God. Is that we should be in such despair for the things that we have done in our life against the God of heaven. Now what happens next in the story, after he hears the book of the law, Josiah commanded the high priest and some others to go out and inquire of the Lord. We need to hear what God has to say to us. This is back in the time period when there was a direct communication access. Um, And so we need to go inquire of the Lord. He needed to do that for himself, because he had sinned, for the people, and for the whole nation. Because Josiah understood something, that the wrath of God was provoked against them because they did not obey the law. And they were in big trouble in the state that they were in. And they inquired of God through a prophetess, that's a woman prophet, named Huldah, to see what God would say to them after this. And so, in short, here is Huldah's message from God that we can see in 2 Kings 22, verses 16 and 17. She gives this message from God. And basically she says, Tell the man who sent you, or tell King Josiah, I will bring calamity on this place. He's going to do it. He's going to bring calamity on this place and its inhabitants because they have forsaken me, worshipped idols, and provoked me to anger, an anger that will not be quenched. 2 Kings 22, verses 16 and 17. God's upset. They haven't been doing what he says. For years and years, and they've been seeking after these false gods. God is saying to Judah, you've done so wickedly, you will be destroyed. However, we also see God's response to Josiah individually and personally. As he says to Josiah, It says, because your heart is open to my word. Because you humble yourself. And because you have repented, I have heard you. And the promised calamity will not occur until after you die. And you will not see this awful judgment. 2 Kings 22, verses 18 to 20. Right? So God says, I will regard you, Josiah. Why? Why is God going to regard Josiah? Because your heart is open to my word and my commandments, right? And you humble yourself. He's the king of Israel. And he's not high up on himself to say, you know, I'm the, I'm the king, I can do what I want, because that's what a lot of the kings did. 
And he says, because you have repented, I'm going to regard you. In other words, really what he's saying is because you have regarded me, I'm going to regard you. And, and you're not going to see this awful calamity. And so that's really the statement that God makes to him. So listen to what Josiah does with this message and, and what his response is. 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. Let's see what Josiah does after this. It says, Now the king sent them all... Uh, uh, sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. Right, Get everybody in here. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. Right? He's getting everybody into Jerusalem. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. So what did he do? He stood there before all of the people of that nation that gathered there in Jerusalem. He called for everybody. And as the king of that nation, he personally read the word of God before the whole multitude, Genesis to Deuteronomy. He read all the, book, the words of the covenant. And I just ask you, can you imagine that happening in America today? And one of our leaders stands up and is going to read all of the, books, the book of the covenant, of the new covenant, before all the people. I, mean, I, I could say this, I would probably be against the law that that wouldn't be allowed for our president to do that. But just imagine this scene. Imagine what's going on here. All, you know, all the people are probably wondering, what's going on? Why, why are we all being gathered together here? And then the, the king stands up and raises his voice toward the people. And he begins reading the book of the law. And you can just hear his voice. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. All these people who had been seeking after idols. So the law of God had been lost, right? It had been hidden. It had been forgotten from this nation for many, many years. And we see all of the wickedness that had filled the land where they were. And what happens when you can, when you forget the law of God? When you let it be hidden? And now here's this king, the king of Judah making a faithful decision, and he is standing in the midst of all the people, and he's making sure that the people know what God requires of him. And that's what this nation would need to do. That's what needs to happen. Josiah was only 26 years old. Again, let us never make age excuses of any kind. So Josiah at that point then made a covenant uh, before the Lord that he would follow him and keep his commandments with all of his heart and soul. He made a covenant. I'm going to keep... Keep your law, 2 Kings 23 and verse 3. And we also see that the people joined in to that covenant. Right? The leader made the decision, I'm going to follow God. I'm going to follow this, and then the people follow. He also commanded that the people, again, observe the Passover that had for so long been neglected. The Passover feast. And this Passover, which was observed during the 18th year of Josiah's reign, the Bible says was greater than any held Passover during all the days of the judges, the kings of Israel, and the kings of Judah in the eyes of God. And listen to what it says about his, his Passover that he had the people keep. 2 Kings 23 and verse 22 says, Such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. 2 Chronicles 35 and verse 18 says, There had been... No Passover kept in Israel like that since the days of Samuel the prophet. And none of the kings of Israel had kept such a Passover as Josiah kept. With all the priests and the Levites, all of Judah and Jerusalem were present in the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Another thing that King Josiah did is he put the Ark of the Covenant back into the temple, Second Chronicles 35 and verse 3. And you realize what that implies, don't you? They had taken the Ark of the Covenant out of the temple and started putting all of these idols in here. And certainly, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's exactly what defines this nation at the time. So when you stop and look at all the things that this man did for God, he stood up and said, I'm going to take a stand. We're, we're, we're not going to do this anymore. And all the things that he did in the name of the Lord. No wonder we can read this kind of a statement about him summing up his life. 2 Kings 23, 
in verse 25. It says, Now before him there was no king like him, who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. And also in Second Chronicles, in that passage, 34 and verse uh, 33, says, Thus Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God all his days. They did not depart from following the Lord of their gods. Notice it says all of his days. And so it really, is there any better statement that could be made about a person? That they, that they sought the Lord with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. And those seeking God today in the 21st century through Christianity and in this country would do well to follow exactly what Josiah is doing in, in this story. You know, like Josiah, churches should start by removing all of the abominations that man has brought in to New Testament religion. Get rid of it. It's not what the book of the covenant says. It's not the original plan. Like Josiah, we should get back to the blueprint, the written word of God, and then go from there. Really, what Josiah is doing is a reformation. We need to get back to what the Bible teaches in everything. The way we worship, the way salvation is taught, in doctrine, the way we live, and everything. We need to go back to the blueprint. Over the past 2,000 years since Christ established Christianity, and brought the new covenant. Man have added their own doctrines to Christianity. They're old to us now, but they were new. Men have added their own type of worship. They do. They add all of these different things that God never commanded. And we read this passage this morning, Matthew chapter fifteen and verse nine. Jesus says about the Pharisees. He says, "And in vain they worship me." That means it's, it's, it's to no avail. It's for no reason. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. People in their own personal lives have also neglected God's ways on, on morals and on righteousness and on purity in this land. How badly this country needs to heed the advice that was written by Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16 says, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see and ask for what? The old paths. Ask for the old paths. Where the good way is. And walk in it. Then you will find rest to your soul. And what's interesting about this is Jeremiah the prophet was alive during the time of King Josiah. That's in the exact context. As a matter of fact, in Second Chronicles 35 and verse 25, you can read about Jeremiah mourning the death of King Josiah. And all the good things that he did. So you think about the context of what he just said there. This is the story we're talking about, and we always use that as, you know, we need to seek the old paths. So ask for what? Ask for the old path, where the good way is, and do what? Walk in. Go back to the old path. Go back to what the Bible says is what we need to be telling our friends and neighbors who are trying to seek Christ. You know, for us, that, that's the exact advice we need to follow. Jesus Christ brought mankind the new covenant 2,000 years ago, and for us... That's the old path. Get, let's get back to the old path where the truth is and where God's commandments are. People wishing to follow Christ today are looking in all of the wrong places. They look at creed books, books that were written by men. They look to their pastors, their preachers, and their priests. But they ought to find the answers written in the book of the covenant, just like this story. And our book of the covenant is Matthew through Revelation. And we need to go back to the blueprint. So many people are being led down the path, the wrong path, because they've strayed from the blueprint. And they, they've mixed up New Testament Christianity and the church. And they're drawing up churches, making their own churches that, are, that Christ never established based on different doctrines. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. It's all of these different religions professing godliness and it seems right but it's the end is the way of death so go back and seek the old past look at your bible look at what's written and you will do well so the theme for our lesson really was to point out that for so long 
in this story, God's law had been forgotten in the land of Judah. People hadn't been doing God's will. They had forsaken Him, did not obey His laws. They allowed the abominations to rule in their land. I just want to ask, I want to close this lesson by asking four important application questions for our lives. I want everybody to think about these four questions. Number one, has the law of God been hidden in your own personal life? Are you reading it? Are you trying to look at the book of the covenant and what is required of you? Are you seeking the old path? Are you obeying it and living it and attempt, giving your best attempt at obeying God's laws? Or has the Bible gotten lost in your life like it had gotten lost in the temple? Has it been forgotten like they lost it in the temple of God? And today, if you think about it, there's a good comparison. is The church is the house of God in the New Testament. And sometimes I'm afraid that Christians have lost their Bibles. And we don't read it sometimes. I I think we have a good congregation who is looking in the Scriptures all the time. And I think we could always do better on that. Question number two. Has the law of God been hidden from your home? Parents, everybody out there as a part of a family, does God's law rule your home? It's something we all need to think about. Listen to the wisdom in this Old Testament passage. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk, to, talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as signs on your hand, <clears throat> and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. All right, what, what's he saying? God's commanding Israel, my word needs to rule your home. It needs to be in your children's ear all the time. You need to be talking about it. You need to be studying it, encouraging it. And so I ask you, does this describe our homes that we live in? Question number three. Has the law of God been hidden from this congregation? And number four. Has the law of God been hidden from this nation? I'll close with a few passages. 2 Kings chapter 22, 16 and 17. says, Thus the Lord says, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants, because they have forsaken me. My encouragement for us tonight is pretty simple, is to uphold God's laws in our lives. Don't let it go forgotten. Don't let it be hidden for years and years and day in and day out. And it needs to be upheld in our homes, in our congregation, And certainly in this country, God's laws need to reign as they did better in in the olden days. And we need to remind this country again that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. So in this lesson, I just hope you can see exactly what happens when God's law is forgotten. May it never be so much as named among us. We're going to keep God's covenant. And so the the message is yours tonight if you would like to respond to the invitation. This is God's plan for salvation. If you would like to become a Christian, you need to obey the gospel. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. That means I'm going to change. I'm not going to walk that way anymore. Confess Him before men. And He's going to confess us before our Father in Heaven. And we need to be baptized, immersed in water to wash away our sins. And then we need to live faithfully until this life is over. If anybody needs to come for any reason, please come while we stand and while we sing.